Thanks for tuning in to the World XP Podcast. If you're enjoying the content, please drop us up, drop a like, and let us know your thoughts below in the comments. Also, please consider supporting our podcast via the link below. It really helps us out. Steve, welcome to the World XP Podcast. I appreciate your time. Thanks to uh, Scott Danner. If you haven't checked that episode out, you guys should go check that out. Um, I saw one of the shorts that I posted with Scott. His name popped up. With the little description, former Navy SEAL, and I was like, ooh, let me message that guy and see if he would be willing to talk. And here he is, Steve. Welcome. Hey, thanks so much, Eric, for having me on. Yeah, Scott's a good friend, and you know he's a fascinating individual. He's all about performance, whether it's finance or whether it's human performance. So he's a, he's a great guy to talk to. 100%. And one of the things that you as a Navy SEAL, obviously, performance is a huge part of that, and we hear we see some of these guys that have come out of the SEAL teams, Jocko and and Tim Kennedy and a few others that have gone on various podcasts and talked about the performance sort of integrating into um, one of the things, oh, who was it? I don't remember who it was. One of the things, uh, Huberman, Andrew Huberman said that the, these professional athletes will only kind of take advice from people in performance if they're tier one military operators, which I thought was very interesting. So it seems that the SEALs have been kind of at the forefront and other operators like like that have been on the forefront of this performance things where there's cold plunges, different techniques to up performance because you guys are in the most stressful situations that there are. Like We can play a basketball game, but nobody's shooting at us. So can you touch a little bit on the performance aspect and then we can get going kind of maybe into your background and some of the other things, but the performance thing from a military perspective is something that's always been really interesting to me for that, that stress level, that, that sort of reason. You know, I would say, you know, it's important to understand that there's a lot of similarities between professional athletes as well as, you know, in the military, meaning that there's a cycle there's an on and off, there's a there's a ramp up and basically an off cycle when it comes to both the military, right, and, and athletics, you know. So in the military, we get back from a deployment overseas where we've been performing at a very high level. Well, we always got to break it back down to the basics, right? We're going to heal up. We're going to do whatever needs to get done, get our, get our family life, uh, our personal lives in order. And then we're going to start working on the next cycle, which would probably see us deploy in another uh, 18 months from that time period. And so that's professional development. That's learning certain skills and gaining qualifications that you need for your unit. And then you move into kind of that group training, the basic SEAL frogman training, and then more specific kind of training, custom tuned and tailored to what you're likely going to face on your next deployment. And so, but with that is, you know, like you said in the introduction is that very specific point of attack or point of performance scenario or situation that you're going to find yourself in. So you look at that in with the athlete, that's that extreme situation. It's the most difficult. It's the most challenging. And it's, it's the very, it's the same. How do we create the architecture so that when we as a team, as an individual, we arrive in that moment that we are able to bring that a game. We're able to perform in the optimum level. Now there's a lot of talk about peak performance. Peak performance is when everything, when luck, and skill and preparation, when they kind of coincide, when they intersect, you are often capable of that peak performance. But a lot of times, there are so many things that are out of your control. So what you can only really count on is optimal performance, meaning the best despite if you're wounded, if you're injured, if you're in the playoffs and you're hurt, you, you still got to work through that. You may not be at your peak performance, but you got to be at your optimal performance. So you do everything to set the table for your success in, the, in that in that from that perspective mm. that's a good way to think about it because you're right people talk about being in the zone you can't be in the zone all the time it's not a realistic thing um i want to back up just a little bit and kind of go through how you got into into the military what drew you to that and then maybe the navy and seals specifically because i know i'm sure uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand for those listening that Steve was an instructor for various training commands and centers within within the Navy. And so when he's talking to building out some of those specific trainings, I'm sure he's got lots of expertise to that. But before we jump all the way in, uh, I want to get a good background, some context for those listening on how you got to where you are and why, what drew you to it? 
Yeah, sure. I, I was, you know, uh, kind of a skinny kid, grew up out in the suburbs outside of Philadelphia. And, you know, I was a very mediocre athlete. I never really was that intense, that that focused or driven when it came to sports. I played soccer. But I always saw myself as wanting to serve and, and more specifically serve in some kind of elite unit, commando unit. And, you know, what I knew about was Army Green Berets. And so that's what I wanted to do at a young age. And I was like, well, I want to go do that. And then I started to learn about Navy SEALs. I had an uncle who was a retired naval pilot, a Navy pilot and an American Airlines pilot. And he's he kind of directed me towards the Navy. And so I, I read a book about SEALs in Vietnam. And I learned more about the selection process. And I said, you know what, that seems to be some of the toughest selection and assessment, you know, training to get into that program that's out there. And I can do it right off the street, meaning I can join. I don't have to wait several years, like in the army, I can go right to buds basic underwater demolition seal training. And so that's what I committed to do. I had a few hiccups and hurdles along the way, but eventually it worked out for me. So I had a friend from high school. He went through ranger school uh, with the army and he discussed some of the we'll say trials and lack of sleep and various other uh, horrible sounding things that <laughs> I would never want to go through. Can you talk to buds and the difficulties, trials, tribulations, hell week specifically as a, is a big one in, in kind of the mainstream lexicon people hear hell week and, and think horribleness all the time. What was that like for you? The first day or two going in what were you expecting was it as you as difficult as you were expecting easier did you over hype it up in your head how was it for you as as that skinny kid that you mentioned jumping right into that yeah and i think it's it's important to maybe you know rewind a little bit and say that yeah i joined the navy to be a seal but i uh i'm not very good at math so i actually missed the qualification for seal you know seal to attend seal training by a couple of points and so long story short, I ended up in Groton, Connecticut after I went through my service school, which is, you know, in the uh, in, in Army and Marine Corps, you have an MOS. In the military, mm -hmm. you have a rating. That's your basically your job in the regular Navy. And so all SEALs at the time had to go through a regular A school. And so my A school was a home maintenance technician. So I literally went from boot camp back to Philadelphia and learned how to kind of be a Navy shipfitter, a Navy plumber. And because I missed the score in the ASVAB, the military aptitude test, I had to go up and work on submarines in Connecticut for a couple of years. But the good side of that was that I was smart enough to like, everybody was like, I'm going to go on this new ship. And I'm like, get me somewhere where it's shore based and I can train. And that's mm -hmm. what I did. And I went up there and I fell in with a really good mentor, a former seal that kind of trained a bunch of us up. And I think, you know, that really benefited me. And so I, I was like, my running was good. I, I couldn't run very well in soft sand. I always, I really struggled with that when I went to buds but I definitely was prepared physically. I had the tools that I needed when I showed up. But that said, like you said, overhyped in your mind, I still looked at SEAL training as this big mythical dragon. And I'm like, hi, and I had confidence issues about whether I could actually kind of make the summit to that mountain. And to me, I think it was, you know, people talk about Hell Week and that being the most difficult. And statistically, that is the case, right? That's where we attract the most amount of trainees. But to me, you know, the, there's an expression that says anybody who's, you know, supremely fit can get through one or two days of SEAL training. You know, almost anybody that's in good shape. But it's the whole fact. It's looking at the totality of it. It's a six-month program just to get through BUDS. And that doesn't even account for the six months training you have to do after BUDS, right, and where a selection is ongoing. But I think when you look at it, when you're really getting punished and, and beaten heavily those first couple of weeks – and you're like, hey, I still got about more than five months to go. That's where a lot of people can kind of lose their purpose. And so for me, people ask me the most difficult part of BUDS. And really, it wasn't Hell Week because I really felt like I was ramped up for that. To me, the most, I mean, it physically was for sure. But mentally, the most difficult part was probably the first week of BUDS. Because that's when they realized we had a you know about 200 people in our BUDS class. And that's just way too many. And they're like, all right, well, let's get rid of the instructors are saying, let's get rid of those that really don't belong here, those that aren't committed, let's just get rid of those. And so they just brought the hammer down hard that first week. In fact, I had to tell the story. I can't, it's probably like day three uh, of week one of first phase. And I came back into my room and my roommates, there was like six of us, right? They were all packing up their stuff. And I was like, where are we going, fellas? We, we, we switching rooms or something? They're like, 
hey, this training's not for us. We're out of here. And I was kind of like, all right, you know, and, and I definitely had confidence, but I, you know, this is kind of bad to say, but if you uh, have ever seen that movie Highlander from 1986, right? If the younger people probably don't know what I'm talking about, but it's about the, the immortal. Every time that one immortal kills another mortal, takes his head with a sword, it makes him stronger. And so every time when I was in hell week and it was cold and we were like shivering and people were quitting, every time somebody next to me would quit, I would feel that much stronger. I'm like, Hey, he quit. It's not for him. I still got this. And so I, you know, I, I wasn't without my challenges in SEAL training, but, you know, ironically, kind of, you know, not ironically, but really the closest I came to not making it through SEAL training was on my dive physics test. Because again, I'm really bad on math. I uh, I failed it. I had to take the retest. And fortunately, one of the Naval Academy guys had kind of uh, taken some time to tutor me up on, on, on our off hours. And because of him, I was able to pass on the retest. So, yeah. So it was definitely super challenging and super hard. But yeah, I was committed and that's how I made it. Yeah. That's one consistent thing I hear when I talk or listen to people who've gone through it. It's more so the mental than not that the physical is not important, but like my friend who went through ranger school said that at certain phases you'd have guys that were better at different things. And so he was better tactically. So maybe he would help somebody write a plan for their time. And then that guy would carry one of the, like his extra bags or like something like that. And there'd be trade-offs yeah. and things like that. Did that occur with the SEAL team yeah. as well? Yeah, for sure. To a point, you know, it's almost like, you know, a little bit too much in the sense that, you know, when you go through budge training, you know, you like, for whatever reason, you're programmed to keep the team together. So you're always like trying to, to like get people, no, 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 don't quit. Come back. When people go to quit, they go to like, go up to the instructor, you try to pull them back and you try to talk them into not quitting. But, you know, in retrospect, you realize that that's kind of, not only is it a fool's errand because they're going to quit anyway, but it's not something you want because you're in a training environment, right? And you want to basically let the people go that don't belong there. Cause buds is you learn basic stuff, right? You learn a lot, but it's at the such basic level and, and buds exists primarily for an asle a selection assessment process. It tests your ability to, to be committed to the team, no matter how badly you're feeling, it, it tests your ability, your intestinal fortitude to keep going no matter what. And it fundamentally tests you to see if you're suitable to work not only in the very difficult environments, hence the cold water, but also in the mediums that you'll work in. So some uh, land warfare, tactics, explosives, weapons, uh, diving, um, that kind of stuff. It tests your suitability to work safely in those environments. And so that's really that's really what you know SEAL training is all about. Now, when you get to the teams, you you gotta you know training's not over. We always you know I borrow this term from some of the uh, my, my army brothers is selections ongoing, which means that we always lose people in the workup cycle. This is after they've already been in, uh, had a year of training under their belt, and now we're getting ready to train with the unit. And a lot of times, if they can't keep up, or, or if there's kind of an ethical breach, um, then then we get rid of people. And it's not that it's pretty much. Every workup cycle, we always got rid of at least one person within the troop or platoon that I was in. Um, but definitely, there's people that are are really good swimmers. You know that you'll you know those guys that towed other guys through uh, training at buds. There's definitely guys that have their strengths, and you try to definitely capitalize and exploit people's strengths and, and try to you know if they're good people and they struggle, um, yeah, we'll come together as a team to help them out. Yeah, for sure. One other thing, as you were talking about the guys that. Uh, that had quit that I thought of was what happens to them because buds is the elite. Uh, the seals are the elite of the elite. So even these guys that maybe have quit buds are still very capable as individuals. Generally, I would think for the most part. So what, where do they go or what happens to them? Are they done with the military or does the Navy find other places for them to, to serve and help out or does it depend on the person? Yeah, you know, and that's kind of, that's looked differently over the years, but I think currently now, and I would say this, you know, that's the one big disadvantage, you know, when you, like, you're taking a big risk, when you join the Navy, you're joining the Navy because you want to be a SEAL, right? There's no backup plan to do kind of what a SEAL does, I meaning there's no yeah. infantry in the Navy. You know, you look at the Army, I go to, I want to go to um, RASP, Ranger Assessment Selection Program, right, to be a Ranger. I want to go to the um, Army special uh selection assessment then 
you know, if I fail out of that, well, at least I can go, you know, be an infantry unit. Maybe I can go be a scout or something else kind of cool, even if it's not my ultimate job. In the Navy, you wash out of buds. You may find yourself chipping paint somewhere, right? So, you know, to me, that's always a big motivator. It's yeah. like, you know, I'm not going to quit, you know, if I sure, because they would, instructors would say that. We'd be out there on the beach. There'd be a Navy destroyer in the background. Like, you want to quit? That's where you're going. I hope you like it. And that was always a motivator to me. But ironically, or you know, you know, it wasn't to a lot of people, and they quit, and then they find themselves extremely dissatisfied. And I think to the Navy, they're not necessarily maximizing, you know, a, a, like you said, a high caliber individual that's just not quite cut out. Because th those that do go on and actually stay in the Navy, they do perform at, usually at a if they can get over their bitterness, they can perform at a very high level and be really good sailors. Um, but yeah, I, I think in a lot of cases they're just disenfranchised, and, and in a lot of cases they're probably out of the Navy. You know, they have at least probably two, maybe three years uh, at that point. They they are going to ride their time out and probably uh, probably find the exit. Mm, fair enough. That makes sense, though. Okay, so you get through buds, and then and then what? You're assigned to a team. You've got your specialty, your MOS, and then kind of what what happens after that so you said there's six months for buds and then you got another six month of training and also at what point did you find your love of instruction and and training where did that come in did that come later or was that a lot in this time frame yeah uh so at first you know it's different now now the pipeline is you get out of buds which is six months and you go on to what's called sqt seal qualification training and that really bridges the gap between the very, very basics at BUDS and what you're going to be expected to do as, as a SEAL operator in a SEAL platoon as a new guy. And so it's that training to really stair-step you up a little bit more. It's where you go through your, your uh, jump schools, you learn more advanced diving, you learn first quarter combat, some urban warfare, more land warfare stuff, air operations. Um, but but back in, when I went through, you went through, and, and to me, I was like one of the more junior guys when I showed up to the East Coast SEAL teams. I actually had to, back then it was called SEAL tactical training, and they only had so many spots. So I, I waited six months before I even got to go to SEAL tactical training. So I'm doing all this other kind of grunt work, going on trips, supporting as a new guy, getting kind of abused, you know, because you, you kind of, you're nothing until you prove yourself on your first deployment. So, um, yeah, so I, I was really doing that. And then, you know, it was probably not so much on my first deployment. Maybe a little bit, but as as SEALs, even junior guys, we go over primarily, you, you know, a lot of what we do is work with other foreign units. So we do exchange training, and that may be our, our peers, right? There may be like, the, you know, it, for me, it was the Europeans. So the Brits, the Norwegians, the Danes, you know, other people like that, uh, Italians, guys that are very capable, like in maybe not in everything that we do, but in certain things like diving, Norwegian's best in the world at like winter warfare, nobody can come close. Um, but yeah, so, but even then you'd find yourself instructing. So I, I think, you know, on other deployments, I'd find myself teaching. I'd teaching like, you know, Kuwaiti special forces, how to kind of tactical shooting and sniper work and all that stuff like that. So you learn it at a very young age. You're taught to be an instructor, uh, not quite to the same degree as Army Green Berets, but pretty, pretty close in terms of what we have to do. Uh, and, and that's when I really kind of um, really started getting involved with that. And then I was supposed to go to uh, selection for a special missions unit. I got injured and I spent my time uh, I spent my time working in what we call trade at training detachment. So basically each each group, East West Coast, they have their own detachment. And I was assigned to a assault cell, which was urban warfare, uh, you know, kind of ship assaults, what we call VBSS, uh, urban warfare, close quarter combat, that kind of stuff. And so I taught that. And, you know, this is kind of as Iraq was really starting to pick up. And I worked for a guy that just was just super hungry and getting the best possible training. And I think we really did a lot of groundbreaking stuff at the time that I was really proud of. And, and looking back, I would say, you know, that is really kind of where I realized just how critical it is. If you really want to be a part of growing a unit proficiency, you got to have quality training. And, and that's when it really was kind of a light for me. And when I look back years later, when I came time to transition out of the military, that's kind of what I connected to is, hey, running good training, teaching people. That's really probably how I made my greatest impact 
So why not try to do that kind of in the civilian world, which is what I decided to do as a speaker, as a trainer. That makes sense. I want to touch on, you mentioned Iraq kicking off and you mentioned before that you went through SEAL training in 96. What was the, and the reason I asked this is because I spoke with a guy on here, a guy named Gary Duno, who was doing weapons instructions after the fall of the, or weapons um, inspections after the fall of the Soviet Union. So he would go into Moscow and make sure they didn't have any chemical weapons and look at the weapons facilities and, and all sorts. And one of the things that I asked him was in the nineties, after the, after the end of the cold war, because I was born, I was born in 96. So I wasn't, I didn't know any of that stuff. What was the mood like in the military having just, because I can imagine, and I've heard stories where after that, ha after the cold war ended, everybody was kind of like relaxed a little bit more. So like that threat of war with Russia was no longer there. And so right before 9-11 and a lot of stuff happened, what was the mood like and how did it sort of transition into the early 2000s? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's like there was a good span of time. So more recently, you know, as a SEAL operator, we're connecting with, you know, what things that we did operationally. And in the last things that we did operationally, you had Somalia, you had Panama, you had Somalia, 93, uh, Panama, 89, Gulf War, 90, 91. And so those are kind of the things that we look, because we had veterans that had done those type of things. Now, it wasn't a lot. It was nothing compared to what we'd be doing, uh, you know, a few years later after 9-11. But that was it. Like anybody that had done anything kind of real, that's who we kind of looked up to. Because before that, it was Vietnam. And, you know, pretty much with a few exceptions, as I came in, most of the Vietnam guys had kind of left at that point. Um, and, and so really, that was the focus. Now, when we would go into places in Europe, we also had, you know, at that period of time, it was kind of the tail end of the war in Bosnia, you know. And so oh, we went right. over as part of the stabilization force on my first deployment you know, the whole war criminals, things like that in, in in Bosnia. And so that was kind of the focus at that point. But when we would go to other countries, you know, other former Soviet countries, you know, like Bulgaria, you know, Czech Republic, places like that, you would kind of still see a lot of that Cold War hangover. In fact, one particular country I went to, um, you know, I went there basically, you know, 2001 before 9-11. And then I went back years later and it was night and day, right? It took a while kind of for that, you know, Soviet hangover to kind of be mitigated. And then, you know, for them to realize a lot of pro a lot more prosperity. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of, yeah, so I don't know if that's really a direct kind of line from your question, but yeah, it's just kind of well, how we look close at things. Enough. <laughs> close enough. Um, was Bosnia, okay, was Bosnia your first deployment? That was, yeah. Okay, so... So you get through training, you're in your unit, and you get orders that you're going to Bosnia. At this, do you have a family at this point yet, or you you just no you no. so so what's just going a single just a single young frogman just just enjoying life. So what's going through your head? You get the piece of paper orders, or however however they informed you that that's where you were going. Was it nerves, excitement, um, all of the above? What were you expecting? How does that process work in terms of also sort of the training they're like okay you're going here we're gonna get you spun up on customs culture all these things that you yeah. might expect how does that all work in the lead up and how are you what what are you feeling how are you feeling and processing it personally as you're as you're getting ready to go yeah so back then you know back then or late 90s uh, and i would say throughout the 90s when you deployed to europe it was you had what's called uh ucom and so it's is European command. So all the European command, right? Um, and within each, which each of those combatant commands, you know, you have UCOM, SOUTHCOM, CENTCOM, AFRICOM, right? Each has a theater special operations component. So you have, you know, SOC YOR. Um, today they have SOC AF, right? Which is Special Operations Command Africa. But back then when we deployed, part of UCOM, you know, for us, we deployed to this forward, forward deployed unit in Germany, we also had to take on the Africa responsibility. And, uh, you know, a few years prior, um, 
there was always, we have embassies and a lot of times embassies get put in peril. And so we'll have to do what's called a NEO, a non-combatant evacuation operation, where we pull embassy staff out of there. And so that had happened in Liberia. And so we were kind of dual preparing. We were preparing, preparing for things like that. Like basically there's always all these civil wars and conflicts in Africa. We were preparing to be, you know, on standby to basically fly down there and rescue American citizens while we're also preparing to go to uh, Bosnia. And so you, as we deployed, we basically had, you know, uh, one platoon from one team, a, a platoon from another team, and we would kind of kind of break it up. So we didn't have a full capability in Bosnia. We didn't really need it because of the mission. Um, but yeah, we did work on that. It was about, you know, kind of chasing war criminals. And, you know, we, it wasn't super kinetic for us. It was a lot of just pretty lame operations. But in terms of your question, we're excited. I mean, SEALs are always excited. Not to say that we're foolish and we want to take unnecessary risks. And, and not to say we don't get scared when things go sideways, right? We feel fear, but, you know, it's the fireman. Who, what fireman wants to go their whole life probably without ever fighting a fire. And that's kind of how we look at it. We we train, train, train. We want to get a chance to use our skills. And so we want to get in the mix. That's just the simple truth. Mm, that makes sense as well. That's super interesting. I didn't know that it was all under one, um, one command at that time. Because I know... Yeah, the 90s is going to – I feel like we're going to look back at the 90s and the early 2000s in terms of internal conflict within Middle East and Africa as sort of strange states where, right, obviously in the 1600s, 1700s, the British Empire, it was like, okay, Britain, then get into the kind of 1900s, got the World Wars, Germany – still Britain, U.S. is there, and then we're in this like weird period where it's just the U.S. and then a bunch of other people just doing crazy things amongst themselves. We kind of insert ourselves a little bit. It's, I feel like it's going to be a weird time in history when we look back like 20, 30 years from now. Um, okay, so you get through your first deployment, and you come... So the reason I asked if you had a family at that point was because I think that's something that people don't often consider when they hear these stories. So at, at some point you want to kind of settle down and develop a family and you're still in the seals. How was that transition like for you as a, like going through that? Because it's not, you're, obviously you're not, a, it's not a normal job. So like you meet somebody and you're like, Hey, by the way, I might be gone for a year or however long that's got to be difficult, I would imagine. Well, it's like anybody, and I'm not, you know, I'm not putting this, again, I'm not putting this on the spouse at all. It's like anything, right? When you, you you know, you meet somebody, you, you know, you fall in love, decide you're going to get married, you know, you're seeing that, you know, and, you, you know, me, I could, I could explain what it looks like again, but we got married or, or we got, we were in a relationship Probably, I think my, I met my wife, you know, you know, 2000, we were in a relationship. We didn't get married till a few years later, but you, you know, after 9-11, we were already in that relationship. And I think you try to explain what it's going to be like, but there's really no way of comprehending it until you're in it. And the divorce rate, I don't know what the exact statistics are, but it's very, very high. And, you know, and, and it not only was the job extremely bad in terms of enabling a successful marriage. But I, I, I played my own part in not being a great husband, not always being the best father either. Um, and I won't make excuses about that. I can't put that all on the job, but I will say that it's incredibly difficult for the spouse who gets left behind. And then the, the, you know, the military service member comes back to reintegrate and that becomes difficult. So, you know, honestly, we're still, my wife and I are still working through damage that's been done, you know, from that, from me mm. being gone and her having to raise two kids with me on deployment. And even when we're home, you know, it may be a little bit better now, but back then it's like, it really, it, like people don't understand you're gone for about six months, but leading up to that point, you're gone more than your home. So you're doing a training trip anywhere from three to five weeks. 
You come back for, uh, you know, maybe one five day block. You come home on the weekend. You got about, you know, maybe four days to get all your stuff together and you're gone for the next kind of three to five weeks. And so there's, there's about 18 months of that. And so that really creates that strain of you're kind of home, but you're not really home. The wife's got to do it all. And so it, it, it I can't, I, I can't just explain how, how difficult that is for the spouse, especially when people are being killed overseas, the amount of stress and pressure that's got to put on the military spouse, you know, it, it's incredible. And so, you know, when you thank somebody for their service, you really should be thanking the spouse and the family because, you know, they're integral to the success too, you, you know, and they bear a lot of um, respect for what they have to endure. When you went back overseas, is that something that you had to come like compartmentalize in your brain? You got the mission and then you also worried about your family back home. How, yeah, I don't, I don't... how did that process work for you? Or was it, or was it just this is what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm here now. This is what I'm focused on. Yeah. I don't know. Like people say compartmentalization. And I guess you have to do that to a certain point. Like you can't just be sitting there spending all your time mulling about how homesick you are. Right. Obviously if things get really sketchy and you're about to do something really dangerous, you kind of just have those thoughts, but you know, in terms of missing home and things like that, which everybody does, I would say most people do. You try to have the best time that you can have on the road with your, you know, with the people that you work with, you know, and, and a lot, it is a lot of good times. You know, you guys enjoy combat operations to a point. Now there's mm -hmm. a, you know, there's a big difference when it's, you know, we're not talking about heavy casualties and, you know, in an extremely high tempo, but if, you know, you're going out a few times, you know, a couple of nights a week, you know, taking the bad guys off the battlefield. Like that's what team guys love to do. Obviously there can be too much of a good thing. Um, but I, I don't know if compartmentalization is the right word. I think it's more a, about focusing on what you have to do. Right. And that naturally kind of pushes other things to the back. If you occupy your headspace with the things, like if you're present, focused and engaged on being prepared and showing up, then naturally that pushes everything else out. So it's not a matter of deliberately pushing and compartmentalizing. It's a matter of being focused and engaged with the things that matter. Yeah. Cause if you're not focused in that environment, something that's not, a, I mean, that's not good because of the stakes, the stakes that are there. Can you, and we touched on this a little bit before beforehand, can you touch on a little bit of the, some of the stuff that you saw while you were in the middle East in terms of culture, the people, um, anything that you're willing to share? I don't want to push push too hard on that, and I know that different people view it different ways. But just for those listening, to give a more a little bit more perspective, maybe of kind of what you saw when you were there. Because us at home, obviously, we didn't experience any any of it. We saw what the news showed us, but that doesn't give a full picture. So. Yeah, I would say, you know, people look at, you know, Iraq sometimes is, you know, a lot of the earlier starts of civilization and very rich in culture, even though there's competing religious sects between the Shias and the Sunnis, and those can be exploited by, you know, different bad actors. But, you know, I would say they have a strong sense of culture and they understand Western values like we understand. Or I, I shouldn't say that. That's the wrong thing to say. But I should say the, like there, we, there's an understanding uh, of values in terms of there is kind of a similarity. Like it's not so dissimilar, even though the culture, yes, it's very different in terms of values and things we understand. I mean, they understand like what Western values are. They understand current events and education and right but you go somewhere like afghanistan and it really like it is prehistoric you know it's really like you know old school old testament like people don't understand the difference between history and what's written in the quran they don't know they just don't know they can't read they they have such a different outlook right in their 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 value for human life they value livestock often more than they value human life. And it's just really, it's, it's really tough. And, and what's funny is a lot of times who has a bigger problem than the white guy, the white Christian guy who goes in to talk to some tribal elders or talks to some Afghan people is sometimes the Arab Muslims have an even harder time 
because they can't get over the fact that they see, you know, Islam differently. And they, they can cause, there can be some real, I, I experienced some real friction points on that. Um, and not to say I'm not trying to, 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 to talk poorly of Afghan culture. It's just very insular, right? And it's just, you know, and, and you could argue there's something to be said for simplicity, but, you know, they just, it's just couldn't be any more different than my experience in other parts of the world. Mm. Gotcha. Okay. So you get, so you get through that, you get through, got through your deployments and, the Middle East, and at what point did you, or at what point did your career start to transition into the program that you created? I think you said 2017. Um, where did that transition start to happen? How did that transition start to work for you? Was that a conscious decision that you made to say, "Hey, I, I don't want to be doing as much blowing things up activities anymore, and I want to kind of move on to the next step"? Was that was that decision made with one eye looking towards transition out of the military? Talk through that sort of that sort of time period for for you and how you were feeling, kind of what what the thought process was. Yeah, you know, and and I would say it's it's like this. You know, you say the same thing in the army. It's um, but I would say maybe more so in in the SEAL teams is you know you're if your career progresses as it should. Your operational time, your time as a door kicker on the battlefield is limited. So every time you do a deployment, you, you know, you should be, if you're a quality performer, you're going to be looked at to assume the next rung in the leadership role. And it starts as kind of your team leader, then it moves up to kind of what we call an LPO, which is leading petty officer, which is kind of an admin type job. You're a team leader, but now you're kind of really in charge of kind of running the day to day um, for the E6 and below, the petty officers and below. And the next rung up is is a, what we call a platoon chief. And that's a, uh, you know, an E7 chief petty officer. You do that, your next rung up. And you, typically after you do a lot of these, you're going to go away from a team and you're going to do an instructor role or you're going to do something else. And then you're going to come back for your next leadership rung because we got to have quality training. Uh, and, and then your next one's going to be as, you know, you're in charge of two, three platoons. And you're known as a troop chief. And then that's pretty much it for most. Now, you your next operation, your next rung is going to be like an operations chief where you're going to be, you know, a master chief at that point, but you're going to be in line to maybe take the command master chief, the senior enlisted leader at a SEAL command, um, where you may go out on, on the battlefield. You may be what we call a strap hanger. You may get to go out in the field with the guys, but really you're not, you're not a tactical leader at that point. You're kind of leading the command at the enlisted level. And so I looked at it, it was like I had finished my troop chief and I, you know, that was it. At the time I was like, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess maybe I'll try this command master chief, but there was going to be a few years before doing that. And, and they said to me, Hey, you just finished your troop chief. You're going to likely put on master chief here and you've never moved since you've been to the East coast, you're going to have to move. And so I'm like, all right, well, where can I go? And long story short, I ended up at, back at Navy boot camp to do uh, what's called dive motivator to onboard training, you know, for the, the, the kids that have contracts to be seal diver, air rescue, EOD, et cetera, to get them ready for their next phase in the pipeline. And while I was there about 2017, I got tasked with standing up a program for the Navy called the warrior toughness program, myself, a psychologist and a chaplain. And we created a program based on how to grow toughness, capability, um, resilience, mental capacity under pressure to be able to kind of turn our sailors into war fighters like they were kind of back in world war ii because hey we may be in combat with the russians or the chinese in a couple years so really build that mindset as a war fighter as somebody that can perform under pressure uh that sailors need to have and so i was fortunate to be a part of that how did the creation of that program work in terms of Somebody comes to you says, "Hey," or somebody, uh, somebody important says, "Hey, I think we need to turn our sailors, maybe make them a little bit more resilient." Where did you even start with that? Yeah, that's was, a great was... question. Yeah, and I had that very question. It's funny. I, this is this is like how things a funny way of turning out, right? So the new with the highest ranking naval person is called the chief of naval operations, CNO. And so one day he comes in and we're at Great Lakes. This is before the program started. It's probably 2016 or whatever. And he had just taken over as CNO and he had his initiatives. 
He had, you know, core attributes. And one of those was toughness. And so we're asking questions. We're going to make our sailors more tougher. And I'm I, my, I'm the guy that decides to stand up in this all hands call, a couple thousand people. And I'm like, sir, uh, I, I'm just curious. What is toughness? What does it look like? How do we know when we're tougher and how do we train for that? And so little did I know <laughs> about six months later, I'd be getting the tap basically myself with a psychologist and a chaplain locked in a room and said, Hey, you three figure out how we're going to make our sailors tougher starting at boot camp." And so that's what we did. And first thing we had to do was define, well, what is toughness? So we came up with a three-part definition. And right in the, the definition had to serve more than just the sailor in combat. It had to serve their whole entirety of their professional and personal life as a Navy sailor. And so they had to have that those dual meetings. And so the first part of that was we have to perform under pressure. Well, we have to be able, like when the bullets are flying, when the missiles are hitting the ship, we have to be able to regulate our emotions and perform under pressure. And the same thing when we're leading people in, a, in an administrative environment and we're feeling deadlines or pressure, we have to be able to perform under that level of stress and lead people properly. Two, we need to be able to take a punch and keep going, right? Again, those missiles are being fired at a ship or we suffer a loss in a career, loss of a loved one. We got to get back into the fight. We got to continue to drive forward no matter what. And the last part of that definition was we have to perform in the day in, day out grind, right? And so that could either mean a very high tempo deployment, combat operations that stress uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, but then also it could be a sailor on a destroyer somewhere looking at a radar screen. And if they if they become detached, if they lose their focus, ships could collide and people could die. So that was our definition. And from there, we built a program based on character development, you know, performance psychology, like mental skills training, like sports psychology type of stuff, mindfulness training. And my contribution was creating a framework, essentially like, Hey, if we want to be good at something, if we want to, you know, accomplish a dangerous mission, here's how we plan, prepare, and execute. And so that was kind of the framework that I brought to it. And it was it was great because I, I really learned a lot from my uh, psychologist and chaplain counterparts. I imagine you would. A lot of – it's the human mind is such a weird place to interact with. So many different triggers and things can – push somebody's button the same thing might cause somebody to react a totally different way from from somebody else and to able to to be able to narrow it down into those three sort of parts of the definition that you mentioned where did the, so where did it go from there so how do you implement that so you've come up with the definition and you go to whoever and you're like hey this is what we think is the best way to define toughness they're like okay great now what yeah, what so we, then? yeah, we've come up with the division of labor. We create, you know, in, in the military, it's no small thing. It, it it is a heavy lift to create curriculum because you know the military is filled. I'll just say it: military is filled with a lot of civilians that will wait you out, that will find a way to tell you how to not do something. Right? Ah, here's here's a hundred ways you can't do it, rather than hey, here, how can we make this happen? Fortunately. The admiral that was kind of running this program, he had a great reputation for just bulldozing people over and getting his way, which was great. So we came up with the curriculum. The chaplains, they focused on, even though they're the religious kind of advisors for the spiritual advisors for the military, it wasn't religious in nature. It was character because we need men and women who can be effective in combat, but we need them to make good ethical and moral decisions. And so we did a lot of that. We created a program where we could, you know, we were actually the ones that were training the drill instructors. We call them recruit division commanders in the Navy. So we were kind of training the ones that would go and then teach the recruits who were going through boot camp. And so we ran that, that training for them. And so it, was, it, it consisted of uh, character things. It was a lot of classes based on character, examples, um, situations we would put the recruits in. But then also whenever they would do a piece of stressful training beforehand we would introduce what we call just in time training we would give them we would teach them a performance skill it was maybe mental rehearsal it was uh, arousal control or energy management as we would call it it would be um self-talk that type of stuff we would teach them that and then they could use it in the actual training scenario and every you know throughout the day they would have what we call daily mindfulness training almost like meditation exercises and so we did this, we created the curriculum for this, 
And we ran it through study and control groups, starting with a feasibility assessment. You got to know like whether it's actually, you know, how, if it can be fit in. So you have groups that are kind of doing something similar, but not getting the training. So you can kind of assess. And what we came up with is we demonstrated that there was a st 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 statistical significances between the, the control and, and the actual study group. So we demonstrated it was an effective program and we moved out with it. Gotcha. And then at that point, it kind of stands up on its own and, and the government kind of does as it does and it becomes a program and it runs it well runs itself is not exactly the right term but at that point is that kind of how it went from there yeah and i think you know it's 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 one thing to teach something and i i like to i like to be candid with basically what, what we did what my part was is i demonstrated you know we our team demonstrated a proof of concept we demonstrated that these things are effective but the real challenge you know, and so we also, I stayed on an extra year. Uh, I delayed my retirement a year so I could help push this out to the other areas that bring people in, in the officer communities, uh, ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, um, and then you know, OCS, Officer Candidate School. And so we, we exported the programs to them as well and kind of taught them how to teach their people. But the real challenge is how does, how does this, and I never got to see this through, and they're still trying to work this piece. How do you get to where you can now grow this? How can you build on this at every command, every one of the thousand commands in the fleet to include the follow on schools that sailors go to after boot camp? And so uh, that was a challenge that I had to turn over to someone else to figure out. Yeah. Part of it, I think almost will, maybe this will not that you are not able to sleep at night because of this, but I think part of it's the, the more generations of, sailors that come through and are trained in that way, uh, the culture will disseminate amongst the, and it should almost just take care of itself at a certain, not maybe not to the extent that will be necessary, but to a certain point, it will kind of just take care of itself almost, you would think. Well, that's right. Right. And so you look at it and again, we, we consider that as well. We looked at it as almost a spread, not only that, not only growing this from the bottom up, but also, an insurgency approach because you're always going to have people that never went through the training who are only going to see it as like snowflake training or they don't fully get it. And so they're going to be the naysayers, whether it's the salty old chief that's been in the Navy 20 years, or it's like some mid grade enlisted guy or gal who's like, Oh, that's stupid. Cause they never really been exposed to it. Maybe they heard about it, but they don't, if you don't go through the training, get a full understanding, you're like, you want us to what? You want us to breathe? You want us to what? Meditate? Are you serious? So without the full context, without really going through the training, it, it, it's a big hill to climb to get people to buy in. Yeah, that's true. Fair enough. Speaking of toughness, well, I guess courage is kind of going with tough. Well, I was going to try to segue to your book. It didn't go too well, but we could just go there. <laughs> we, could, we could just go there anyway. So, so you've got you got out of the navy and you decide you want to write this book called Life on the X. Um, how did that, was that a natural progression for you? Or was it something that one day you're like, you know, I really want to write a book or was it something you'd been thinking about for a while? And how did you get, cause you haven't been in the Navy for 27 years, tons of stories, tons of subject material to write about tons of different paths you could go down on to write a book more than one book likely. How did you decide on this subject material and, and to write one in the first place. Yeah, I'll be honest. I always kind of cringed, you know, when it's like, oh, another, because there's always a joke, right? Especially from the army guys. Oh, another seal is writing a book. And that's all I could think about. I'm like, hell no, I'm not writing a book. Like, why would I write a book? But, you know, I realized what I really wanted to do is I wanted to be a speaker and I wanted to be a trainer. I want to be a consultant. And I realized kind of, you know, and I'll be very candid. I, I did it because I want this to help drive that business. And that's initially why I wrote the book, you know, and that sounds just kind of very, I, I don't know what the word is, but that, you know, that sounds very superficial in that sense. But the truth is though, is once you get into it, it becomes a lot more, you, you have a lot more passion now, you know, cause I am passionate about the things that I teach. So why, you know, would I not be when it comes to putting, you know, that stuff into a book. And so really 
the, what the, the reason I wrote the book is because I believe in the things I talk about. And a lot of things I learned, not just in my naval career, but in creating and being part of creating the Warrior Toughness program. So a lot of it is the things that I learned from my counterparts in Warrior Toughness. And, you know, the book is meant, and there are some of my stories in the book. And the book is called Life on the X, a Navy SEAL's guide to meeting any challenge with courage, confidence, and readiness, right? And so it's prescriptive in nature. And I want it to be kind of a business book and a self-development book. Really, the X refers to kind of that pinpoint location, right? We fast rope out of a helicopter on the rooftop of a building we're assaulting, or, you know, we get into the kill zone. That's the X. And we got to be, we got to have our A game in that moment. And so that's what we gear our preparation for. And the simple fact is that we all have these moments, you and I do, and they're going to look different. It may not be life or death. But it could be a conversation with a, an engagement with a client or a customer. It could be leading a team for the first time. It could be any of those things, a pitch, a proposal. We got to be ready. We got to seize opportunities in those defining moments and situations. And so this book tells you how to do that. And so, again, I interview people, CEOs, uh, former professional athletes, Olympians. So it's not just my story. I want it to be a story that breaks down into you know prescriptive steps that people can use to be ready for their most important moments. And it's out now. It's been out, came out what, like a month ago, something like, something like that. Yeah, it came out a month ago as, as it is, you know, it's April 3rd right now as we're recording. And the audio book will be available on April 18th. So and where can people find find that? Amazon, all the usual places? All the usual, I, I, anywhere online books are sold to include uh, Amazon. Same thing with the uh, audio book, Audible. So yeah. Fair enough. Any last nickels? No, man. It's good. Good conversation. I, I appreciate it. I think we, we hit a lot. It was, we, we hit it hard and heavy, didn't we? Mostly yeah, we did. me uh, running my mouth, but yeah. <laughs> no, it was good. We got through all the information, all the good stuff, hit it right in the hour that we needed it to. That is a concise and jam-packed interview. So for those listening, uh, I'll put the link to Steve's book in the description along with uh, his Instagram and other links website. I think looking at your link tree right now, tons of stuff. Um, so go check that out. Tons of cool stories in the book, I'm sure. Stuff that maybe he expanded on from from here. And yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>